I got so now we're recording and now I'm going to share the the screen again so we can okay all right okay so today like I said I think I just wanted to briefly touch on the different types of commercial lease agreements mm -hmm. uh, break them down at a high level and then we'll just go ahead and ask if you have any questions about the topic and any of the lease agreements feel free at the end we'll we'll talk uh, maybe a little bit more in depth about it and then I'll be happy to send you guys the slideshow as well as I have a little booklet that I created uh, that's just kind of a reference guide that you guys can utilize going forward if you guys ever want to invest in commercial real estate or uh, if you ever come across a situation where you would need to know this information it's it's definitely useful information to have so before we get started I want to talk share this quote uh, mainly because it's it's always whenever you're in a commercial transaction a lot of times you look to benefit the most you can out of the transaction but sometimes it's hard sometimes you fail to realize that in, in a lot of these situations you are going to be dealing with the other person on the other end in in some way in the future so at, at the end of the day i think it's important to know that if the deal isn't good for the other party it isn't good for you so don't ever approach a, a negotiation or a situation to where you're looking to gouge the other person as much as you can uh, because you may have more information than they do or whatever else. Uh, it's always good to try to maintain a level of, of decency as, and, and uh, mutually beneficial uh, relationship. So I thought I'd just share that before we started. So to start off, the, the first lease type that we, we're going to review is related to a gross lease. Now, what a gross lease is, is that the tenant pays one flat rate and the owner is responsible for all other types of operating expenses and whatever else. These are most common in retail, office, mm -hmm. industrial, multifamily uh, properties. Uh, in these scenarios, because the owner is responsible for all other expenses, generally the base rents are higher. So you can imagine if you're a tenant, uh, you would pay, let's, let's for, just take it for example, you pay $2,000 a month and that would cover your water, your electricity, your everything. You just pay the $2,000 to the landlord and the landlord takes care of everything else. So that's what a gross lease agreement would look like in, in a commercial setting. Number two is the modified gross lease. Now these are slightly different than the gross lease being that the costs are shared by both the landlord and the tenant. Uh, these are most common in retail, office, industrial, and multifamily situations. Uh, now the responsibilities of both the tenant and the landlord are negotiated. This is where the negotiation portion comes in. Uh, in a lot of situations, what, what I've seen is, it, let's say you're negotiating an office deal or an office lease. You would, as the lessee, come in and say, look, we're willing to pay this base rent, and then we're responsible for paying our own internet, water, electricity, and then you as the owner are responsible for everything else. Now, the same thing could be said if you're a landlord and you negotiate saying, look, I'll, I'm willing to accept this base rent of $2,000, but I also want you to pay on top of your internet, water, whatever else. I also want you to pay a portion of the, the cleaning expenses and the trash expenses that are shared by all the people in the building. So that, that could be an example of a modified gross lease. And in these situations, the base rents tend to be lower, uh, slightly lower than the gross lease amount. Make sense? So far good. We're good? Yeah. Okay. All right, now this is one of the lease types that gets kind of interesting. So this is prevalent primarily in the retail space. Uh, in particular, restaurants and retail locations that have high volume of sales, so groceries and uh, clothing stores, that sort of stuff, you see these type of lease agreements. Essentially what it is, is you'd pay a flat base rent, and then on top of that, you would pay a percentage above a certain break point as defined within a lease agreement. So I provided an example below. So let's say, for example, that you have agreed to your base rent and then you define in your lease document, you say, we're going to pay you 5% of gross sales above $750,000 as extra rent for the year. 
So in a percentage lease agreement, let's say that this individual, as you can see at the bottom, had a gross sales of $950,000 and their break point was $750,000 for the year. That means you would subtract 950,000 from the 750 and multiply that by the 5% and that gives you the $10,000 of additional monthly rent or yearly rent that would be that would have to be paid by the tenant. Yeah. Now this this can be beneficial for the landlord in the set, especially if they are the ones who are beautifying the center in order to drive traffic. Uh, generally, you can negotiate a percentage lease so you can share some of the upside with the tenant uh, if they do achieve higher sales as a result of your efforts to beautify a center or beautify the area so that people want to be in that area and thus sales increase it as a result. Yep. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Land lease. So this is not as common in the area. There are definitely land leases out there, but I would say these are definitely more prevalent on the East, East Coast. And I've seen a decent amount on the West Coast and Phoenix area and that sort of stuff. Essentially what it is, is you are leasing the, law, the raw land. Uh, and these are most prevalent in scenarios such as mobile home parks. Uh, if, if for some reason you, you rent land and then there's a billboard on it, uh, there's farmland and then sometimes in prime real estate development where the land is very valuable sometimes the owner doesn't want to sell the land and they're just interested in leasing the land at a lower rate now because they are leasing the land uh generally speaking it just it, base rents tend to be quite a bit lower than the other uh, mm -hmm. lease agreements however there is a catch which is something that needs to be taken into consideration if you in fact want to enter into one of these agreements is that if you lease this piece of land and you were to build a building on it, that building would then become a fixture of the land. So in real estate law, that means that that land, I mean, that building is now part of that piece of real estate. So in, in, in a situation where you would like to develop property on that piece of land, you need to make sure that you get a long-term lease agreement in place. A lot of times with large developers, when they take a piece of land that is a, a great piece of piece of property and they lease the land and then they build something uh, a big building on top of it that's going to cost them a ton of money they try to get a very long lease in place a lot of times it could be over 100 years including the options oh. so that's something that you need to take into consideration uh prior to pulling the uh, pulling the trigger on, on a land lease deal okay okay <clears throat> all right and, now these, these agreements are generally the ones in the commercial real estate setting that landlords tend to prefer. Uh, and this really is because you're able to pass along increasingly more expenses to the tenant, which limits your management of the property and also uh, your expenses, right? You, you, get, you can tend to get more to the bottom line uh, if you're able to get into some of these lease agreements. And these are what's known as net lease agreements. These are most prevalent in the industrial sector, retail and office. Um, so as, as I mentioned in net leases, the tenant is responsible for paying some or all of the operating expenses. And there are three particular lease net lease agreements. These are single net, double net, and triple net. Yeah. Now in single net leases, it's where the tenant is responsible for paying a portion or all of the property taxes. So the single N in the single net refers to the property taxes. Yeah. Okay. That's the first one that's taken into consideration. And along with that, they're generally responsible for paying their own operating expenses, such as water, electric, phone, internet, et cetera. Uh, the landlord will then be responsible for the insurance and the maintenance of the building. Got it. So that is a single net lease agreement. Number two is double net leases. Now the double N signifies first the property taxes and then the second insurance yeah. for the building. Uh, and then also the operating expenses such as water, sewer, electric, phone, whatever else is generally uh, the responsibility of the tenant. <clears throat> and then the landlord, really the main responsibility that they have is maintenance of the building and then maintenance of the common areas as well. So if, you can imagine if you have a shopping center, the sidewalks, the, the, the parking lot, whatever else, they're probably responsible for cleaning it up, uh, making sure that uh, that if the parking lot is cracked and there's potholes, then they're responsible for filling it. That's the landlord's responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that would be in a double net lease. 
Now, generally the most sought after type of lease agreements in these scenarios is a triple net lease. Now what a triple net lease is that it, the land, the tenant is now responsible for paying property taxes, insurance, and maintenance on the building. So really the landlord's responsibilities are limited to very little. Uh, and, and you see this a lot in uh, the investor circle in particular with larger properties, which we'll talk about, which is related to the absolute triple net. Uh, yeah. But landlords really in a triple net agreement are still responsible for the structure in the roof. So mm -hmm. a, tr a true triple net lease, for example, is like a dollar general. Yeah. So a lot of dollar, dollar generals out there, if you were to purchase one, that is a triple net agreement in that you, you, they would be responsible for paying the tax insurance and maintenance and paying a base rent on the property, but you still would be responsible for maintaining the structure and the roof mm -hmm. uh, in that agreement. Yeah. However, now there is something known as an absolute triple net, which means that you literally don't do anything as the owner. You pass on everything to the tenant and they are responsible for essentially giving you a check every month known as mill box money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what you see a lot of times in single tenant net lease agreements with Walgreens and sometimes Taco Bell's, McDonald's, that sort of stuff. You really are going to see uh, absolute triple net. Absolute most triple net. And what you, see, what you see done a lot of times with these investors is that they purchase or they do a 1031 exchange. They're maybe a little bit older and they don't really want to have to deal with all the management. So they would take some of their properties, do a 1031 exchange into a, a single tenant net lease situation with a 10 to 15 to 20 year lease in place. And even though they're getting maybe a five or 6% return a year, they don't really care because there's absolutely pretty much no management whatsoever. Um, or they're able to capitalize on some of the benefits of owning real estate, but they don't have to deal with the headache of managing the property. It's corporately guaranteed by a financially stable tenant and long term. Yeah. Long term, yeah. yeah. So that, that's what you see. That's where you often see absolute triple net leases. Oh, okay. So if you're a landlord, if you're a tenant, which ones would, should you choose? Which one should you go after? Now, it's probably not a great answer, but really it, it depends, right? There's a lot of factors yeah, you can consider. Yeah, and there's market back. conditions, yeah. property yeah. class. I'm sorry, yeah. Ronnie, what did you say? Yeah, 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 go ahead. I just said it depends. Yeah. Oh yeah, no worries. Uh, so there's a lot of factors you gotta consider. I mean, there's, there's market conditions. If the market's doing well, the market's doing poorly what the property class is, how, how well located is it? Is it a class A, class B, class C property? Uh, where is it located uh, based on, I think someone's trying to, mm -hmm. someone trying to get in? No, okay, sorry, I thought I heard something. So depending on who, uh, depending on the class of property, with, where it's located, Along with that, uh, comparable properties in the area, such as in KCREA and various other, uh, I'm sorry, comparable properties in the area. So you have to examine uh, if everyone in that area is giving you a multi, uh, modified gross lease, then, I mean, that, there's not much you can do, right? As, as a landlord to be able to offer anything other than that. Or if you do, you gotta make sure you modify the base rent in order to attract the right type of tenant. Yeah. Uh, in our local market, the best way to discover some of these uh, pieces of information is to look at KCREA. That's essentially the commercial real estate, um, multiple listing service, essentially. Uh, yeah. you, you can find out, even if you're not a member of, of NAR, you could still access that functionality and search for a lot of the information that you need in order to make an educated decision. Now for additional information, if you need to talk to a commercial real estate agent, they can, they can look up the additional information for you and help you make the right decision. Uh, but it is very important to consider all these different factors before pulling the trigger on a particular lease type. Yeah, yeah, got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, sorry, why is this slow? And then finally, what I, I kind of want to briefly touch on different things related to COVID-19 because it is affecting quite a bit of commercial people in the commercial space, business mm -hmm. owners, investors, whatever else. So, if you, if you do find yourself in a situation uh, where you're struggling to meet your financial obligations, there are programs out there that are helping business owners and investors in this time. Uh, primarily the ones that, 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 that are pertaining to investors are probably the IED, IE, EIDL advance. So depending mm -hmm. on how many employees you have working for, you can get up to $10,000 in advance for uh, 
your operations. Uh, the PPP loan uh, is something that helps you make payroll for certain, for, for your particular business. Uh, on the SBA website, it lays out all the different criteria that you would need in order to meet, uh, whether or not you can actually qualify for some of these programs. If you do qualify, consider doing it. I mean, right now I know that they're talking about how they're running low on funds as it pertains to the, the initial $350 billion that were, was proposed by Congress, but they're already in talks about possibly pushing that number up to help more small business owners in, in, the, in, the, in the United States. And so if you haven't done so already, consider doing it. I mean, it may be an opportunity for you I, to- I'm not qualified for that. I don't have any uh, employees, so I'm not qualified for that. I'll you may be able to still qualify for I, I, the EIDL loan advance, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're a sole prop proprietor. I don't know how you're structuring your, mm -hmm. your, uh, your investing. Yeah. But if you have if you have an LLC and or or your sole proprietorship, you may be able to qualify. Not maybe not for the ten thousand total, but you may be able to qualify for a portion of that. So I do a little bit of research to see if that's something that that would that would help you out, yeah. uh, because I know people who have done uh, mm -hmm. that and they're able to qualify. So okay. food for food for thought. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and the same thing. And we've kind of talked about this, I'm sure, in, uh, in other types of uh, settings, but talk to your landlord, talk to your property management company, banker, and yeah. try, to get, try to get on the same page with them to see if there's any way for you, for, for you guys to work out an agreement. Because at the end of the day, if you're a landlord and your tenants aren't able to pay, it's better that you are able to work with them uh, mm -hmm. in this time of need uh, so that you maintain a strong relationship long term and you're able to come out of this unscathed. Uh, because otherwise you're, you're going to be in a situation where it's not beneficial yeah. for either party. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Cool. It's a lot of information. I know it's ton. And, and, and the good thing about it is though, I, I'm, I'm happy to share these slides. I have another, I, like I said, I created a booklet that contains all this information. So if you have, if you would like that booklet, I'd be happy to send it over to you guys. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll make this also available on, on Facebook. Hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll post this as a video so people can tune in and yeah. mm. gather additional yeah. information. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I was planning to actually, um, I was uh, working with, um, my Jeff O'Brien, uh, with the, like, I just start with the commercial property, like not less than like a 50, 50, 50, 50 units one. Then I, I lined up my family uh, family investors like my brother-in-law and other people um, and uh, uh, michelle ron is helping me with all the uh, kind of agreement like a um, what's a technical like a um, working agreement like who to what who is what and who is having kind of everything then after that we uh, we created another llc all the names and everything then mm -hmm. after that this covid 19 came up then uh, then my family people are suggesting me not to move forward at the moment uh, with the commercial property kind of thing. So like my, my, my own one is just, just a single family thing. And uh, I'm partnering with my family people doing that. But I kept a pause on that going just a pause for till uh, this COVID-19 uh, COVID like kind, kind, kind of things are like uh, settled down. So I'm waiting on that. So once yeah, it is done, yeah. um, we'll be jumping onto the commercial uh, multifamily thing. That's great. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and then again, uh, because of what's happening right now, a lot of banks are kind of putting the brakes on issuing new loans. That's another thing to consider. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I talked to Republic Bank, for example. They're, they're, I mean, you, you know, but as far as, because Chris is in Cincinnati and, uh, or I guess you're Butler County, right? In Cincinnati, I think, or not Cincinnati, in, in Ohio. Uh, but Republic Bank told me, I have two people that I know at Republic Bank that pretty much told me they're, they put, a, put the brakes on issuing yeah. the for now. So they're mm -hmm. kind of putting, they're, they're building up the applications, but they're, they're really focused on trying to issue the PPP loans, the EIDL loans and everything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was, uh, I have one, uh, I was trying, like right now I'm just talking to one of the, the which one? Central Central Kentucky Federal Bank savings. The people are like they're they're okay with the uh, with the single family uh, loan mortgage on that. So I'm working with that people right now. I'm sending all my information to them. 
but I said I have to close on all the property this one time, single family. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to do or go or no go kind of thing. So I was talking to the people what these other investors are doing with the single family uh, things like under like you know below hundred thousand or hundred fifty thousand property. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the investors said they're buying it. You know, if the if this nice a nice prom property in nice area and everything is good, so they are not jumping aggressively. But if everything looks good, numbers are everything is good, then the investors are buying the properties. Yeah. I mean, people still need a place to live. I mean, I like I said, I I, I have a fourplex here in Louisville. Uh, I had a tenant move out early this month. She was a senior in, in college. I, I, I bought the property in old Louisville. And so she moved out about two months early. So I started marketing the prop, the studio apartment that she was occupying maybe about two weeks ago. And mm -hmm. I got so many applications. I probably got, I don't know, six yeah. or seven within two week period. And oh. I just picked, I just picked someone. She's moving in the beginning of May okay. and she, she's a student and her, her mom was going to guarantee the lease. And so it worked out pretty well. But I mean, I think if, you're, if your property's located in a good area uh, mm -hmm. where there's demand, I, I don't see why you don't jump on it. You know, I, if you have the funds, if you feel comfortable at least having some reserves in place, I, I don't see why it would, would really affect your decision too much. But yeah, it's really dependent on you as the investor and what your, what your, uh, what your goals are, what your strategy is. Um. I'm, as individually, I want to build my portfolio with a single family, mm -hmm. I think me and my wife. I, at the same time, I'm, I'm looking at the bigger picture with this uh, commercial problem, uh, multi, multi family commercial, problem, multi, multi units. That was, uh, uh, that's what, that is, was I planning like everything with uh, Jeff O'Brien, Rachel Mann. These are people helping me to create this structure. Uh, these are creating a structure. So suddenly this came up and it's, we paused on that. So the people are like, a, like just be planning to get like a, let's get all the four people, 100 each, make, put 400 in the bank account, then go for the property. That was a plan, as a planning, that was a plan. So my hundred was there, other three hundred, three people, three hundred was not coming into the account. So yeah. this, as of now, this right now, I'm focusing on single family right now. Single family. Yes. That's that's a great strategy. I, I think it, it either either way, if you do multifamily, if you do residential, uh, if you do retail, if you do office, you know, there's there's all yeah. different types of of strategies to do it. Yep. So, so. So when all the plans are coming in, suddenly this came up. Okay, maybe this is like six months or seven months or whatever it is. Till that time, just focus on the single family, then jump onto the commercial multifamily. That was uh, my plan. Uh, so. Awesome. Well, yeah, I mean, it, like I said, if you guys have any other questions, feel free to reach out. I mean, I, sure, there's definitely. an email address, yeah. uh, phone number, website. I also, if, if you want, I can send you guys this, these slides. And I'll send you the booklet that I created that, that lays out everything we just discussed in a little bit more detail. So it'll just be a good reference for you guys to have. And yeah, I mean, again, if you have any questions, feel free. You know, you know like we are the regular people, right? we connecting regularly every time. So uh, whenever we have the questions and I know where to, who to reach out and all that thing. So, so. And I'll post, I'll also, like I said, I, I'm going to post this on some different social media outlets. So you'll be able to yeah. read. Because what my suggestion is just talk to Rob, if mm -hmm. not affiliated to the Kriya, but maybe he can send out his, this as a separate meeting. Maybe other people can join this meeting because I don't know how many people know about this today's afternoon meeting. Mm -hmm. When I see the Kriya meeting, minimum of 50 people are joining that meeting every day, like oh, every sure. day afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, so talk to him and he has any other alternates to send the invite to the people but these are in, uh, like useful information so mm -hmm. uh, just talk to him uh, you okay. know right Rob. yeah okay okay yeah. well thanks guys i appreciate yeah. you guys hopping on thank and you for your time man oh yeah. yeah no thank you for hopping on and, and and engaging with with what we're doing and so like i said if you have if you guys have any questions i'm always available sure definitely thanks thank Rafael. all right thank see you guys mm -hmm. all right bye thanks i'll see ya